Coming up in this edition of Animalia, monkeys overstaying their welcome in a village by eating more than their fair share of food, an indication of how fierce these magnificent animals can be, and dogs that are setting fashion trends around the world. All that and more coming up on Animalia. In Keshapur, an area in the southwestern Jessore district around 350 kilometers from Dhaka, a group of villagers are doing all they can to save the long-tailed langur, a monkey once seen all over Bangladesh, but which is now an endangered species. These days, langurs are only found on the outskirts of Dhaka and in a few scattered villages in the rural areas. About 100 langurs live in harmony with some 2,000 Keshapur villagers. The monkeys are part of their daily lives and depend on the villagers for food and shelter. They live around and sometimes practically in the homes of these villagers. The langurs have always been an integral part of their lives. The langur, locally known as the Hanuman, is believed to be a descendant of the Hindu monkey god Hanuman, known as the god of power and strength, who remains celibate all his life. Their sacred status is enhanced by the langur monkey's reputation as a constant companion to Hindu holy men. For many years, there have been a significant number of langurs living here. They enter the homes and take away food and sometimes even snatch food from the children. While visitors to the village are fascinated to see the bond between the animals and villagers, the villagers complain about the langurs who have become violent with their food demands. If someone is carrying a banana or any other food, the langurs attack the man and snatch what he has. Sometimes they invade shops and take away the food for sale. However, no matter how wild the monkeys get, the villagers ensure they're not harmed in any way and will not get rid of them. There's virtually no government initiative to preserve and enhance the Lango population. There's an estimated 230,000 Hanuman Langurs left in India. Here we are at Barcelona's zoo. And this is Snowflake, the world's only known albino gorilla. Snowflake's fans are flocking to the zoo for a last glimpse of the snow white primate, who arrived 37 years ago from the forests of what is now Equatorial Guinea. But Snowflake is dying of skin cancer. Vets seen here at a press conference say the animal probably only has weeks left to live. Once something of a prima donna, Snowflake has mellowed with age. He's now about 40 years old, or 80 years in human terms, and a cocktail of antidepressants, painkillers and other drugs has softened his character. Since the first day he arrived, he was the star of the zoo, and he always knew it and acted accordingly. Now he's become very sweet, like a model grandfather. The zoo says the 140 kilo gorilla will be cremated like all their other animals. Spanish paper El Pais says residents are already talking of immortalizing Snowflake with a monument, or even by naming a street after him. As we learned from the last story, while the sun is something to be enjoyed, it can also be harmful. Dogs are looking cool in specially made glasses. Human beings are not the only ones who need to protect their eyes, and Munich-based business Dog Goes knows it. The firm, launched at the start of 2003, sells glasses specially designed to fit canine heads and pet owners are rushing to buy the objects which offer 100% protection from UV rays, rain, sand and wind and can also help dogs with eye problems. A series of adjustable elastic straps keep the glasses in place. They're described as being immovable even in the roughest of scraps with other hounds. 
Fashion conscious dog lovers might also be tempted to buy the glasses as attractive accessories to raise their furry friend's street cred. Customers can choose from six different models in three different colours, pink, blue or yellow, and also from sizes ranging from small for beagles and spaniels to medium for bassets right up to large for boxers and labradors. The firm also offers a special gold frame just for Yorkshire Terriers. But the Dog Goes manager, Sylvia, is unwilling to market the glasses as merely fashion items. After all, the glasses were originally designed to protect mountain rescue dogs from damaging their eyes from the glare of the sun on snowfields. Sylvia says they have customers who go skiing with their dogs and also those whose dogs have eye problems. She also claims 90% of Dog Goes customers drive soft top cars and want to fit their dogs with glasses. Customers are most concerned about the effect that harsh weather conditions can have on their dog's eyes, and cabriolet drivers can now be joined by super stylish canine companions. Glasses range in price from 79 to 89 euros. I say, Roger, I'm feeling rather peckish. Can we stop soon for a bite? She looks like any normal calf, but baby Footy is not your average bovine. Genetically, she's the identical twin of a cow who's nine years older than she is. Footy is officially the continent's first cloned animal. Africa's latest celebrity was born four months ago at a research centre in Brits, 65 kilometres northeast of Johannesburg. In Zulu, her name means replica. The cow that she's a replica of is simply known as LMJ C865, a champion milk producer. Ordinarily, this cow would have been used to breed. Her offspring conceived through intercourse with a male animal, giving the calf the genes of both parents. But in Futi's case, there was no need for a father. All her genes came from LMJ C865. Dr. Morn de la Rey is one of the brains behind the project. Every cell of the body contains DNA or genetic information. So de la Rey extracted one cell from LMJ C865, took out the DNA and put it in an egg cell. Now that it had the full genetic material, the egg cell thought it was fertilized and footy started to grow. It may sound like science fiction, but this practice has existed since the late 1970s. Still, the first clone mammal, Dolly, wasn't born until 1996. She was able to have her own offspring, but it wasn't all a success story. She had arthritis and lung disease, and her creators had to put her down. Why she was so ill is still unknown, but those who oppose cloning claim that it may have caused genetic effects and her early demise. As opposed to Dolly, Footy is growing up in the open air on sunshine, green grass and lots of love. Dr. Dilla Ray sweeps aside the critics. He's convinced that this is the way forward to feed the starving people of Africa. That cloning can rescue Africa's people from starvation is doubtful, but recreating high-performing animals could be of interest to breeders. Still, they've been doing it their way for centuries, simply by mating the healthiest animals. The genes of these cattle in East Africa have been selected by nature. Drought and pests have made the zebu a resilient and hardy breed. The Maasai are traditionally pastoralists, raising and herding cattle. Over 400,000 live in Kenya today, and most still have their cows, who are not only their most prized possession, but also respected and loved. One would think that cloning would be welcomed with open arms by a people so attached to their animals. But the Maasai didn't even accept modern medicine straight away, so it will take a long time. But even if traditional cattle owners were to give their blessing, it's unlikely to affect pastoralists any time soon. The consumers of South Africa's meat are closer to where it's all happening. 
And here, opinions on eating meat from cloned animals are divided, some believing only God can give life, while others are more enthusiastic about applying modern technology. With or without God's help, the idea of a world full of copied individuals isn't everyone's cup of tea. Is human selection really preferable to natural selection, where the environment decides which species will make it and which one won't? But in spite of the controversy surrounding her, Futi sleeps easy, at peace with the world. Three baby cheetahs, rescued from the wild after being orphaned when their mother was attacked by a pride of lions in one of Kenya's national parks, are receiving a lot of tender loving care in an animal orphanage in the country's capital, Nairobi. The cubs, Sharon, Kala Linda, named after the lodge where they were found, and a third who remains nameless, have found a new home among 21 other orphaned animals. The cubs, which were found when they were two weeks old, are now four weeks. They're among a population of a thousand cheetahs in Kenya currently. They've joined three other orphan cheetahs in the orphanage park. Since their arrival, the cheetahs have been under the watchful eye of the Kenya Wildlife Service Veterinary Unit, who've set aside animal keepers and an animal curator to look after them. The KWS Veterinary Unit is based at the organization headquarters in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. The unit has wildlife veterinarians, technicians and animal capture staff who can be mobilized quickly to save wildlife, as was the case with the cheetah cubs. The unit, which insists on growing healthy populations of wildlife in the country and also preventing the extinction of rare species, has been providing a balanced milk formula for the cubs every four hours until they're old enough to be weaned on foods which will mainly comprise of meats. They're on a milk formula diluted with a little bit of water and then supplemented with egg yolk so they can get some protein. They grow really fast at this age, so they need to be supplemented with calcium as well because their bones are growing really quickly. By the time a cheetah is five months old, it can chase well. In captivity, cheetah cubs can live to an age of between 16 and 20 years. In the wild, they can only make it to 10 years. They'll probably have to stay in captivity as cheetahs are particularly difficult to introduce back to the wild after having been hand reared. With all the cuddling, these cheetahs will grow up tame and they will never experience the challenge of a wild life. The animal keepers taking care of them always keep an updated record of an animal's health and are currently happy with the progress of the cubs. And so, life will continue for these baby cheetahs who've joined other animals like rhinos, leopards and other cheetahs who've been living in the orphanage. <laughs> According to CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, which ensures an international cooperation in the regulation of wildlife trade for the purpose of conservation, cheetahs have been placed under Appendix 1. Animals under Appendix 1 are critically endangered species for which no commercial trade is permitted. Meanwhile, the animal orphanage attracts many visitors eager to view these magnificent animals and learn all about them, while engendering a feeling of respect for all forms of life. Elephants are faring much better on the whole than cheetahs. Seven wild elephants from South Africa's Kruger Park have been relocated to Mozambique in the hope that this will ease environmental destruction to the park caused by its elephant population. Park rangers seize the two cows, their two calves and three young males in an hour-long operation, swooping low over the herd in a helicopter and shooting them with tranquilizer darts before employing winches and a conveyor belt to load them into the giant articulated trailer. Kruger's elephant population has swelled to over 10,000 since Nelson Mandela's government slapped a moratorium on culling in 1994 
Over the last three years, more than 5,000 animals, ranging from antelope to zebra, have been moved to Mozambique, which saw most of its own medium and large-sized animals killed off during years of civil war. While workers have already started pulling down parts of the 350-kilometer fence separating Kruger and Mozambique, little has been done to integrate Zimbabwe's Gonaraju National Park. Along with 47 elephants, which have moved since 2001, the new arrivals from Kruger National Park will be fitted with electronic collars and tracked inside a fenced-off 35,000-hectare sanctuary in Limpopo National Park. Hundreds of onlookers Many of them locals who'd never seen an elephant crammed onto trucks and buses around the sanctuary perimeter, engines revving should any of the disoriented beasts decide to burst through the wire fence. Upon arrival, the elephants seemed bewildered in their new surroundings and were coaxed from the trailer by rangers rattling sticks. After ambling down the ramp to the ground, the elephants calmly surveyed the scenery before heading off to disappear into the bush. The animals can rest easy in the knowledge that they're guarded night and day around the perimeter of the park. And if you ever see ivory for sale in the shape of trinkets and bric-a-brac, remember those goods came from these mighty and wonderful beasts. Malaysian actress Michelle Yeoh poses with two rare and endangered Chinese tiger cubs bound for South Africa where they'll learn survival skills for a life back in the wild. The pair of South China tigers named Cathay and Hope made their way from a cramped enclosure at Shanghai Zoo to a reserve in South Africa. The 12,000 kilometer journey which is part of a bid to bring the endangered animals back from the brink of extinction. The Chinese government says less than 30 South China tigers live in the wild and another 60 live in zoos. Tigers are disappearing because of the destruction of their natural habitat in densely populated southern China and as demand for products such as tiger penis believed to enhance sexual potency encourage hunting. The animals will be taught on a 500 hectare facility how to hunt impala, a graceful African antelope and warthog which are good stand-ins for the deer and wild boar found back in China's dwindling forests. The two tigers arrived in the National Zoological Gardens of South Africa, and when the cage doors were opened, they bolted quickly into a larger enclosure where they will spend a few weeks before they're taken to the reserve where their hunting skills will be honed. Male Chinese tigers can grow to 175 kilograms, not big by tiger standards, but big enough to send shivers down the spine of an impala. The Save China's Tigers Foundation hopes to transport another five to seven tiger cubs to South Africa over the next five years, and then introduce the tigers and any offspring into a specially created reserve in southern China from 2008. But whilst we endeavor to keep the tiger population from going extinct, Man and beast struggle for survival in the world's largest mangrove forest, the Sundarbans, which supports a dwindling population of tigers. Forest ranger Haidar Ali began his daily patrol after evening prayers as his colleagues relaxed at the end of another day. Not long afterwards, he was dragged screaming into the heart of the Sundarbans. Ali, whose half-eaten body was found the following day, had become the latest victim in a struggle for survival that is as old as the relationship between man and beast. This man, Manu Mola, explains that he was carrying firewood back on his head towards his boat when a tiger attacked him from behind. He gashed his forehand with one of his paws and Manu fell to the ground. He managed to shout, Tiger! His friends came to his rescue 
and the tiger ran away. The scar is a chilling reminder of the dangers these woodcutters face on a daily basis. These incidents complicate the task of those trying to save the Royal Bengal Tiger, Bangladesh's national symbol. Royal Bengal Tigers tend to turn into man-eaters as they age, losing their speed as well as their teeth and claws. Even forest rangers who are armed for protection face extreme risks in the thick mangrove forests. The Sundarbans along the coast of the Bay of Bengal covers nearly 6,000 square kilometers of Bangladesh and 4,260 square kilometers of India. A profusion of wildlife, spotted deer, boars, monkeys, crocodiles, snakes and hundreds of species of birds live there along with the Royal Bengals. Bangladeshi authorities say that as many as 40 people a year are killed by tigers, with scores more seriously injured. Three years ago, a forest ranger was attacked by a tiger from behind. He tried to fire his gun, but failed. Fortunately, a group of wood collectors rescued him but his injuries were very serious. Poaching has declined since the World Cultural Body, UNESCO, declared the Sundarbans a World Heritage Site in 1997. Meanwhile, authorities at Trivandrum Zoo in southern India are celebrating their most prized possession. Three newborn tiger cubs completed their crucial first four months. The cubs are the first successful captivity birth in 15 years for the zoo in Kerala state, which has five tigers, two females and three males. Karishma, their oldest tigress, gave birth to the cubs in May, and since then the entire zoo has paid careful attention to the cubs' well-being. The tiger family has been transferred to a special enclosure. Tigress and cubs are receiving regular vaccines and a high-protein milk diet with some extra beef dishes thrown in for the nursing mummy. The first few months are extremely crucial for the cubs as they are susceptible to infection and could also face rejection by the mother. The tiger family still has a long way to go as the risk period for cubs is at least one year. But at this juncture, they're looking pretty good. See you next time on Animalia. Some of us, 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 some of us